Hello, and welcome to Food Polis. This is our series on presidential plates. Politics has become, and perhaps always has been, a flaming refuse heap. So, we're going to humanize these political animals by taking a look at some of their favorite cuisines. Now, everyone knows President Trump's affinity for fast food. That's old news, and whoever acts as if they're above eating McDonald's is politicizing food. And we don't do that here. So, let's ask President Trump what his favorite food is. Okay, question? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I uh, just asked what your favorite food is. And maybe that's a question you should ask China. Don't ask me. Ask China that question, okay? When you ask them that question, you may get a very unusual answer. Okay, so he's in one of those moods. Luckily, we know that President Trump has a soft spot for a certain home-style dish his mother used to make for him. Meatloaf, meatloaf, meatloaf. Not only does President Trump love meatloaf as well as meatloaf sandwiches, but he encourages others to share in his love for the dish as well. And who blames him? And this is so important to me. Now, let's get down to the cooking process. I've found this recipe online, and it seems as legitimate as Joffrey's claim to the Iron Throne. Let's get to it. Before we move on to the actual cooking, which is what you're here for, let's turn the lights down low, flicker on some candles, and get real comfortable. Feel free to follow along. You start making yourself a cup of coffee, which you benevolently give to your wife instead. Then go ahead and make yourself a cup, all for you. Mm-hmm, <laughs> that's nice. All right. This recipe calls for a Spanish onion. I'm pretty sure that just means a yellow onion, but if you feel like yours is not Spanish enough, you can give it a name like Hernan Cortez or Picasso. I purposely chose this ugly onion since you're undeserving of anything else, and we're going to just go ahead and give this a quick dice. Then we can set it aside for later. This recipe also calls for a couple of Christmas berries, one green and one red. We'll cut the walls of the berries on all four sides, slice them, and then dice them. Pay no heed to my poor slicing ability shown here. This table isn't counter height, so it's messing with my preparation game. Each of these berries has this white stuff inside called pith, with a th. Apparently it's bitter, so we remove it. Now, I ended up making this meatloaf twice for this video, and I recommend going finer on the dice, which I did in the second go-round. Parsley. This is urgent. This is priority number one. If you do not include this parsley, this is not Mama Trump's meatloaf. Just don't do whatever it is I'm doing here. Just pluck off the leaves individually, then chop them up to whatever consistency you like. Since it's going into a brick of meat, you won't really notice larger pieces. Ah, so pretty. This is garlic. You've seen it before, haven't you, garlic? I won't show you my super awesome garlic chopping ability since you'd be way too impressed. Now we do the oil drip into the pan. I'm using a little bit of grapeseed here, but you can use whatever you want. Now watch this. Ah oh, yes, the shimmer. A little bit of butter will also taste pretty good, so in goes a pad. Once we're up to a medium low heat, we're going to start cooking Cortez. He's going to release a lot of juices, which you can see steaming up and out of the pan. We'll continue mixing these around, giving them a bit of color and bam, in goes the edible salt and ground black pepper. Once these are pretty cooked down, the Christmas berries make their entrance. Christmas berries are approximately 94% water, so we're going to dehydrate them some as well. This is probably going to take around 15 to 20 minutes to reduce and gain a little color. Creating a little well into the middle of the pan, I'm going to pretty much miss the mark with the garlic and let that get nice and cooked before mixing in with the rest. Now this is where everyone's going to scream because I'm adding the can of diced tomatoes into a cast iron pan. The recipe calls for a beefsteak tomato, but canned works just as well. Just don't add in all the liquid like I did since you'll need to cook it out anyways. In goes in more edible salt and more ground black pepper because I like to season every layer since it's easier to see how much is going in. 
Once this is cooked down a good amount, we're going to transfer this to a big bowl until it cools. I will be refrigerating it overnight, but if you decide to make this, you can just wait until it cools off normally. Now let's talk meat. Loaves of meat can be made from pork, from ground beef, or from pretty much any other ground meat. I'm using 80-20 ground beef, as that's what Mama Trump's meatloaf calls for. Additionally, we need a few more ingredients, which we've partitioned into these nice little bowls like the fancy chefs do on TV. We have two beaten eggs, which we're going to hydrate a two-thirds cup of seasoned breadcrumbs with. If they aren't seasoned, that's probably fine. Since our vegetable mixture cooled up and hardened overnight, I'm going to mix it up a little bit. I'm using a KitchenAid since I'm married, but feel free to use whatever device or human appendage you wish. We're going to go ahead and put the wetter stuff in first, like the egg breadcrumb mixture and the chopped parsley. How lush! Now, as this is running, I'm going to break off segments of the ground beef and toss it in until we've added two pounds of ground meat, and everybody has commingled and become infected with one another, like COVID. Here's for our second round of screaming, as I'm going to do something non-traditional. We're heating up a little bit of grapeseed oil here, then coating the pan so it's shiny. With my first meatloaf, I got weird with it and decided to make it into basically an ultra burger or a pizza, filling up the entire cast iron with the meat mixture. I kept the heat on during this process to encourage a little browning on the bottom. The final ingredient for our meatloaf is some tomato puree. A few scoops did the trick, and I lathered this all over the top of the meat pie before adding more edible salt and ground black pepper. This is now heading into the oven at 375 degrees Fahrenheit for about an hour. This unconventional shape was, well, unconventional, but it tasted like a good meatloaf. Don't you worry, I did a normal shaped meatloaf as well, and you'll get to see it very soon. Here's our pizza shaped meatloaf all by itself. You're probably looking at the time and saying, wait, there's still half a video left. True. This recipe calls for a side of mashed potatoes and mushroom gravy. We're just gonna use your traditional russet potatoes. And here's the thing. I don't peel my potatoes when I make mashed potatoes, and I'm not gonna lie and pretend that I'm just making rustic mashed potatoes instead. I simply dislike peeling potatoes more than I like peelless mashed potatoes, plus more vitamins and minerals or something. So we're cutting these up into bite-sized chunks and placing them in a salted pot of water. This fancy pot came from MTC Kitchen, where you can waste time and money buying cool kitchenware you do not need. Heat is being applied now, and once cooked to where a potato falls apart with gentle prodding from a fork, we drain. We're adding an entire stick of butter before mashing, then in goes the milk. Let's move to the final component of our dish. Here, I have way too many mushrooms, which you'll see at the end. I'm going to give them a quick rinse as well as a quick dry. Now guess which mushroom I'm going to pick. Ha, huh, you were wrong. We'll take this stem out which I keep for stock, and then if you're a big fan of chunks, you can cut them up into slices, or if you're like me and hate the texture of mushrooms but love the flavor, you can cut them small or use the time-saving method and put them into the food processor. Whatever you like to do is fine. We're also going to be using half an onion and a few cloves of garlic in this recipe. So here we are, more oil in the pan and more butter. We'll melt that down before placing our half-diced onion in. Once that's cooking down a bit, we're adding our 10,000 mushrooms. These have a lots of water which we're going to try and cook out. It's like our own little anabasis in here. Now more butter goes in and we'll cook the garlic in that. This has been cooking for probably 30 minutes at this point, so we're going to thicken it up with some flour, which will cook for a few minutes before adding in some beef stock. The first time I made this, I didn't add in nearly enough stock for the amount of mushrooms I had. As you can see, I add the broth in little by little, stirring it as I go. You probably don't have to do it this way, but I find it easier. I've also got a few <clears throat> secret ingredients here, including mustard powder, cracked black pepper, Worcestershire sauce, soy sauce, and some salt. Now, as I said, the second time I made this, it was way better. The first gravy had far too many mushrooms. The second time I have the amount of mushrooms and I use shiitakes instead. You can see how silky this one is, and that's because I added more broth and cooked it longer. Now, here it is, the final showing. The meatloaf that is shaped like meatloaf. You think I'd let you down? I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this meatloaf. Plate up some taters, precious, and take a look at this. 
You see that juice running down the side? I like that. Now a generous portion of this small G godly gravy all over the plate. So how did it taste? This is probably the best meatloaf I've ever had. I'm not sure if that's actually high praise or not because I've only had a few meatloafs, mostly from my mother. But if this was served to me in a restaurant, I wouldn't be disappointed. The meatloaf, even without the gravy, was pretty flavorful. I might even like it better without the gravy. And don't forget to wash this all down with President Trump's favorite beverage.